हेलो एवरीवन आई एम समरजीत मिश्रा एंड आई टेक पार्ट ऑफ इंडियन पॉलिटी एट वजराम एंड रवि सो व्हाट मेजरली वी डील विद इन द क्लास इज ऑल अबाउट द सेटअप ऑफ इंस्टीट्यूशंस व्हिच डील्स विद रिसोर्स रीडिस्ट्रीब्यूशन इन आवर कंट्री एंड यू माइट बी नोइंग रिसोर्सेस आर ऑफ ऑल टाइप बी टेंजिबल और इनटेंजिबल टेंजिबल लाइक द वन दैट यू कैन टच एंड फील एंड इनटेंजिबल लाइक द वन which you might not touch but you can feel like that of justice equality fraternity and liberty polity is one of the most interesting subject which deals with this and you as aspirant of civil services are going to become a part of polity so this is what we learn in the class and understand how the application of polity actually works in the country when we'll interact we'll talk a lot about the philosophy behind polity how the constitution of india was made what exactly is a constitution and how constitution is specially placed in case of the indian polity at the same time we'll talk about the philosophical basis the ideals the aspirations the values for which we fought the national freedom struggle and then when we got the independence how we engraved them in our constitution and applying that we have been governing our country since more than 7 decades now on that part let's try to understand another part that we interact in the class all about which is about elections and since elections are overhead i'm sure all of you must be keeping a track of what is happening in the political arena of the country let's talk a little about elections so basically if we talk about election as a topic elections is all about the process of choosing our representatives why representatives now india is a hugely populated country right we are close to like 1.4 billion people now 1.4 billion people cannot come to a consensus at the same time at the same place to decide how this society has to be governed so in that case what we have done is in the modern democratic form of the state we have understood that we can have representatives who can represent our interest and that's where we choose our representatives to represent us now every time that representative sits in the lok sabha or the state legislative assembly or any such platform and says a yes it is deemed to be a yes from our side every time she says a no it is taken as a no from our side if that is the case that what they say is what is deemed to be we saying the same thing don't you think that should actually be the case which means the person should be saying the thing what we want which means we need a person inside who really represents us which means we need a person with character we need a person who understand the interest of the society a person who is qualitative now how can we make sure that people who go inside the legislature or the legislative bodies are qualitative people one of the way of making it sure is to make sure that the process by which they go inside the legislative bodies is a qualitative process which means what we are looking at is not just election as a quantitative process of choosing the representatives but rather we are looking at elections as a qualitative process to send in qualitative representatives what we are looking at qualitative representatives that is because elections they establish democracy and you need to very well understand that in order to understand election we need to understand what election constitutes or brings to the society in one word we have to tell what election brings in then let me tell you election brings democracy because elections are the most visible symbol of democracy elections are most visible symbol of democracy does that mean that every time there is a election it is a democracy which means what i'm trying to ask you is that are election and democracy synonyms can we interchange the words while we're using them and the answer will be a clear no though they are very very intricately related it looks like one is derived from the other yet there are limitations as far as the synonyms are concerned election is just a process of choosing the representatives which would constitute the democracy but not necessarily elections and democracy are interchangeable or are synonyms we need to understand that if there is a polity 
and in that polity, in that particular political setup, elections are conducted. Then we say that democracy is there. But then you need to understand that in a particular political setup, elections can be conducted namesake also. There can be autocratic leader who is conducting elections for namesake. You can have a country which does not have a clear choice given to the people, but yet elections are conducted. You can say that elections are being conducted there. Would we call these setups as democracy also? No, not necessarily, which means the clear understanding between them is that though elections leads to democracy, which means election is the means to realize the end of democracy, not necessarily every time elections are conducted, it would be a democracy. So the relationship is very straightforward that for a democracy to be established, we definitely need elections. But only if elections are conducted, we cannot conclude that it is democracy. Then when we would conclude that elections are being conducted and we'll call it a democracy, that takes us to our basic idea that only when the elections are qualitative, we would call it as a democracy. And when I say qualitative elections, what do I mean? What I mean is that the body which is conducting elections is independent. What I mean is that people who are voting in elections really have choice. What I mean is that the whole process of conducting election and people voting their representative is free and fair. This is where I say that the elections are qualitative. And that is where we understand that yeah, yes, qualitative election is what which can take us to the idea of understanding of a democracy. So basically what I'm trying to say is that it is only independent elections which can take us to a functioning democracy or a functional democracy. Now, why is this independent election so much important? Let's try to understand that. See, basically, even applying common sense also, we can understand that only when a body is independent, then only it is capable of conducting a free and fair process. So if I talk about it in the context of Election Commission of India, the constitutional body which is responsible to conduct elections in India, what I'm trying to say is that only when the Election Commission of India is an independent body, is not having the undue pressure of any other powerful authority, it will be able to conduct free and fair election free from the unwanted pressure as we understood and fair for everyone who is a participant in the election process, be it the candidates, be it the political parties or be it the voter. A question to be asked over here is that, are Indian elections really free and fair? Take a moment to realize that although our mind would say as an answer that no, no, they are not free and fair because we have seen so much of unwanted elements and events in an election. Let me tell you, quantitatively speaking, that is very, very, very less. For instance, there are more than 10 lakhs polling booth in India every general elections. The unfortunate events that we are thinking of or talking of, what would be their number? 2, 20, 200, 2000? But then if you look at free and fair election as a process, I can very well conclude that of the 10 lakh polling booths, I'm sure that for major part of it, the process was free and fair. Which means if I have to conclude whether Indian elections are free and fair or not, it will be a justice to use a word largely, they are free and fair. Which means what I'm trying to say is that there are 543 Lok Sabha seats. Can I say that all 543 have come up to the Lok Sabha using wrong means? No, we cannot say that. But at the same time, can I say that all the 543 seats were filled up with the most righteous mean? Also, this is questionable. That's why the word largely. Now, because Election Commission of India is an independent body, it is capable of conducting largely free and fair elections. Now what happens when elections are free and fair? What happens is a very simple thing and that is 
acceptance of results acceptance of results is a very very important thing do we accept all results in our life we have given so many tests so many examinations we have been part of so many competition are we really accepting anything and everything not really we accept things where we feel that the process was free and fair otherwise we resist right but because we have understood that indian elections are largely free and fair we accept the results what i am all trying to say is that acceptance of result let me just talk about it in the form of data if we look at 2019 general elections bjp the single largest party which is the ruling party also now forming a coalition of what we call as nda got close to 37% of the votes it got close to 37% of the vote mathematically speaking 37 out of every 100 indian voters were saying yes to bjp to form the government isn't it conversely can i say that 63 out of 100 of every voters of india were saying no to bjp to form the government absolutely if that is the case close to 2/3 of the people are saying no to bjp to form the government but when mr modi was invited to take the oath or to form the government by the president of india did we come across any kind of agitation any kind of strikes any kind of protest anywhere that we are 2/3 people of india voters of india who are saying no to bjp to form a government no rather whatever results were declared by the election commission of india we accepted it and why we accepted it we accepted it because we believe that indian elections are largely free and fair let me tell you it is not about 37% we have formed government with as low as 29% also if you remember a little of data regarding upa2 we formed the government with 29% of the vote which means more than 70 of every 100 indian saying no to congress to form the government but did we see any kind of a protest or agitation or strike or lockdown no we did not that is what i mean to say when i say that we accept the result and we accepted the result only when we had this idea that yes indian elections are largely free and fair now what happens when the results are accepted is a very simple thing which is peaceful transition of power so in india we do not come across a civil war every 5 year rather there is peaceful transition of power that we have been witnessing since more than 75 years now right and because peaceful transition of power happens there is a level playing field which makes sure that none of the body it tries to influence or lure the commission to be biased rather an independent commission is maintained which is again capable of conducting largely free and fair elections where the results are accepted and then again peaceful transition of power happens what you look in front of you is exactly how practically democracy works so it is great to say that democracy is government by the people for the people of the people but then how does democracy work it works like this and for this the election commission has to be independent because then only qualitative elections can be conducted when you understand this part that it is very very important for the democracy for having an election commission which is independent which is capable of conducting free and fair elections you'll understand that what importance is provided to election commission of india the constituent assembly especially dr ambedkar understanding the importance of democracy gave a dedicated section in the constitution which is part 15 of the constitution which deals with elections if you look at elections there are six provisions in part 15 where we can understand on the one side about article 324 which talks about election commission of india 
which is the constitutional body which is responsible for superintendence, direction and control of all elections in India, be it to the parliament, be it to the state legislature, be it to the office of the president or be it to the office of the vice president. So this is the body which is responsible for elections. On the other hand, for our understanding, we can look at article 325 to article 329, which talks about the general principles of conducting elections in India. And therein we come across things like article 325, which talks about universal suffrage. 326 which talks about adult suffrage, 327 which talks about power of the parliament to form enabling legislation, 328 which provides a similar kind of power to states to form enabling legislation and article 329 which bars the interference of court during electoral process. This format of looking at election from a constitutional basis forms the idea behind elections in India, which can then be developed to many of the practical application that we see around, wherein the election commission has got many powers and function to work upon. Be it the power of superintendence, direction and control, be it the power to regulate the political parties to an extent, be it the power or the function of issuance of model code of conduct, or be it the advisory jurisdiction of post-election disqualification, or be it setting campaign expenditure and monitoring it. I believe this is good enough a base to start understanding elections, which is one of the most important things in GS2 polity. I hope it made some sense. We'll meet again to look at more details of it. Thank you.